Welcome to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. Today, we're going to talk about food security, specifically about the Keahuli Opanaeva Polyforestry Project and its NOAA Climate Dashboard. Now, that's a lot to unpack. NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Polyforestry is a type of agroforestry, which is in itself a type of regenerative agriculture. That's basically how my grandparents farm, no-till farming that sequestered carbon from the air, farming that regenerated the soil by rotating crops, farming that worked with the environment instead of killing it the way today's monocrop farming does, monocrop farming that repeatedly sterilizes the land with chemical herbicides and pesticides, then relies on chemical fertilizers to grow the same crop over and over again. Now, agroforestry is a specialized type of regenerative agriculture that involves growing food as part of a forest ecosystem. In a food forest, you can harvest food from the trees, from plants under the trees, and even from the animals that otherwise help manage the ecosystem by fertilizing the ground and eating invasive weeds and insects. Polyforestry is a variation of agroforestry. The poly can mean both many, reflecting the many ways to grow food in a polyforest, but it also means Polynesian, to reflect the people who have used this traditional farming practice for centuries. Polynesian agroforestry or polyforestry. We're also going to explore NOAA's climate dashboard projects. These projects work with communities to combine ancient regenerative farming techniques with modern tools and technologies to help address climate changes, growing impact on our food systems. We're joined today on Zoom by Tom DiLiberto, climate scientist and public affairs specialist for NOAA's Office of Communications. Hi, Tom. Hi, Bob. Pua Kamaka is the coordinator of NOAA's Pacific Islands Region Collaboration Team for the NOAA Regional Collaboration Network. Hi, Pua. Aloha, Bob. Uh, Justine Kamelamela is the director of the Keahuli Opanaeva Project. Hi, Justine. Aloha, Bob. Maile Luavai is the president of the Panaeva Farmers Association. Hi, Maile. Aloha, Bob. And Maka Ala Rollins, who is the community outreach coordinator for the Keahuli Opanaeva Project. Hi, Maka Ala. Aloha, Bob. So let's start a little bit with the climate dashboard. What does that look like? I mean, I envision a web page, a phone act, something like that. What is the climate dashboard? Well, we're using the term dashboard very loosely at the moment. Um, it can actually be a web page or products that we develop. We're really just waiting to see what the community needs, um, what and how NOAA can best help them achieve that through these products. So it could be an actual app on your phone because nobody really takes their computers out into the field anymore. It could be a coloring book. It could be all sorts of different things. So those conversations are ongoing. Um, and we'll, when we get there, we'll have a dashboard of many different types. So this is actually very early in these projects. You're, you're, you're still developing, getting input from different communities of what a dashboard looks like. Correct. This um, project we're talking about today, the Keahuli Opanaeva project, um, that's obviously Hawaiian. What does that actually mean? Mark Ala, could you translate for that, that for our listeners? Uh, yes, Bob. So Keahuli Opanaeva, um, Keahuli is, it, it means um, the changing roots of Panaeva. And the Kea'a is the root, the rootlets that come off of, of, a, of a tree or a or a kalo plant, or you know, um, any type of plant. Those are the aerial roots, the a'a. Uh -uh. And then huli is is a reference to like a turning over of a of a season, like uh, or a turning over of uh, a change in a cycle. Um, and this this idea of huli is also connected to kalo, which is a, another Polynesian a, a canoe plant. So. Kia'a Huli Opanaeva is, is, is all, these, all these ideas about change and this, the roots of change and, and the next generation of change that, 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 will, that will be happening um, uh, on this land. So um, that's, it's, that's it's, a very strong image. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's supposed to come from an idea of, of resilience and change and adaptivity. 
and um, and, and and cycles. So Pana Eva is actually a location that that's the place. Yukaihuli is is the change, the the growth of that place. Aye, and and we and and being native Hawaiians and uh, and living on um, Hawaiian homestead lands, the the huli are, are are us. We are the we are the huli. We are the next generation. We are the change that we try to seek for our community. Thank you, Makaala. That like I said that's a very strong image, a very powerful and positive image. Um, so how did this project get started? Justine, can you tell us about that? Yes, Bob. Uh, this project started um, with our kupuna. It started uh, generations ago. They have, um, we have a history here in Panaeva of monocropping. Um, geared towards profit rather than um, towards taking care of our aina and our people. But traditionally, as we discussed, like Native Hawaiians, um, we've always had complex agricultural systems. And deep down, our kupuna know this and um, had wanted a space for our community to come um, and and use our our knowledge from our kupuna and to you know to not revive it but to put energy into it for our next generation. You keep referring to kupuna for our, our listeners. That's your elders, correct? Yes, kupuna is our elders, and um, I guess with this project, they're always at you know the forefront because they put down uh, their prayers for this, for this project, for this um, to be successful for the next generation. Sounds like this project's been going for a while, you know, just, just this yes. process of working with the elders and such. Um, at what point did, did NOAA and the Climate Dashboard become involved? Did NOAA approach the Farmers Association or did you folks we reach out to NOAA? Justine? I think that connection would be with uh, between Maka'ala and Pua. Maka'ala and Pua. Maka'ala, you want to comment on yeah. that? Yeah, for, for sure. I would like to comment on that. So um, I, I guess how, how Pua and I connected was just through this climate dashboard. Um, and it was, I, I, at the time I was the, the president, uh, not the president, sorry. I was sitting on the on the board of our um, our KPCA, our Keokaha Pana'ewa Community Alliance, our nonprofit um, arm, that helps to um, helps to fund some of our Kelkaha Panaeva Farmers Association activities, and um, Pua had reached out to uh, had reached out to us to see if we'd be interested in participating as um, you know a Native Hawaiian a Native Hawaiian farming association um, in these climate equity dashboards to to represent the communities um, statewide. So it was uh, I had represented. Um, Farmers, Kilkapan, have a Farmers Association, but there are others in the climate equity dashboard from um, Lanai, from Kauai, from all over the Hawaiian Islands. So um, it was it was to have a sit down and, um, and and a talk story with a lot of these NOAA leadership, which is which I think um, Pua can talk to this better because it, this is I think a kind of a, a a neat a neat point about this climate equity roundtable discussions and how those things came about and, and how this um, project kind of manifested as well. So Pua, how did you, I mean, obviously you have this group, these people doing this stuff and you reached out to them. What was it about them that attracted you to, you know, that inspired you to make this initial contact? So in 2021, we were um, asked by NOAA leadership to convene a series of climate and equity roundtables across the country to gather feedback um, from community partners to inform how NOAA provides climate services, engages with underserved and vulnerable communities, and strengthens internal processes to respond to express needs. Um, and so these roundtables were hosted um, through NOAA's regional collaboration team. Um, there's eight of us. And I'm the Pacific Islands Regional Coordinator. We have Alaska, West, Central, the Gulf, Northeast Atlantic, the Great Lakes, um, 
Caribbean um, and the Caribbean team. And so each of us, because we have sort of that broad knowledge of the area and you know our our various teams and networks, uh, we were asked to help NOAA leadership put together these roundtables. Um, and so to slightly tweak it, because out here you tend to the term roundtable sounds so um, formal and you know traditionally um, all of our Pacific Island Ohana we learn and pass on traditions through talking story and so we slightly changed the term um, of our roundtable to a talk story and we brought together um communities and organizations throughout the Hawaii, like Maka'ala said. So we tried to be very diverse and get um, a perspective from each of the, the Hawaiian islands um, with various backgrounds. Um, and to better understand um, how we can, how climate change is impacting them, what kind of adaptation are they doing, and increasing their capacity to take action that will enhance their resilience and doing it all in a way that's pono or right. And so that was really the underlying sort of foundation and goal that we were working on um, as the dashboard project um, emerged. And so through these climate and equity roundtables or our talk story, um, we heard what each of these communities we're looking at and um, Noah, we had leadership present on these calls and they heard it and um, they were inspired. And so each of us sort of had to unfortunately pick one community that we wanted to help as a pilot project to really showcase how Noah can better serve these communities um, with climate data. And we, we worked with um, we picked the Panaheva community um, just because it was so different, but it touched on so many points. Um, you know, food security, indigenous communities, you know, traditional farming, um, and really like how has all of that incorporated um, and changed or shifting as a result of climate change. Makaala, I mean, I hear where Pua is coming from. How did your community respond to NOAA? The idea of, okay, here's this tech crew. I mean, did the farmers leap to embrace that or, or you know, was it a slow process? Um, a good good question, Bob. Um, I think what, what it really kind of boils down to is, uh, is trust. And um, historically, uh, the, federal, the, the federal government has has been less than trustworthy, especially with um, Native Hawaiians. Uh, and, and so, you know, um, with Pua, with Pua coming in and 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 asking um, and, and really kind of uh, showing that NOAA was an agency to be was a trustworthy agency that kind of helped um, on it, it helped us on our side to, you know, um, Better see them as as partners in this as partners in this endeavor, and um, so I think I think that's a I think that's a key word for me that I, I always I always look at because our community, in a sense, our community trusts us. You know, some uh, trust us to help make great decisions, and so we um, we trust we we trust that these relationships will be. Um, the ongoing and uh, and developing as as time goes on, and so I think um, those are those are some of the the key key things that um, I, I'm try, I try to I try to focus in on, and um, building that trust back up with with these with these um, federal agencies, and and showing that not all federal agencies are are bad; they can be trustworthy, and you know um, especially with um, NOAA, they they have um, they have a lot of they have a lot of weather data, a lot of longitudinal data, and I think some of this data is is very um, helpful for for farmers in in helping to plan and and prep for for their farming activities. So, 
I think I thought there was a, just a, a great um, a great marriage between these our, our traditional farming practices and and a lot of um, Noah's weather data. And some people think, oh, why is why is it an agroforestry project? Doesn't Noah do doesn't Noah do water things and um, and and marine and marine things? And the answer is yes. But from a from a native indigenous perspective in Hawaii, what we do on the land affects what happens in the ocean too. So we see we see that you know the like how you're saying about monocropping and the um and and the put and the adding of fertilizers we know that synthetic fertilizers just add to algae blooms and it doesn't it doesn't help the um the coastal ecosystem at all so trying to pull away from these those practices and and toward towards more of our traditional practices um seemed like a, a good a good marriage of, of these two things of traditional knowledge and contemporary knowledge so yeah, I hear several things uh, that is unique about this project. Um, what other components of this project make it unique? Justine? Yes. Um, so our community is unique. Um, we're all Native Hawaiian in our community, 100% Native Hawaiians that live within our community. So we... Um, you know, will benefit from this project. Um, and then also what is unique is that our project will become almost like a plant library. Uh, we have um, around like nine varieties of, of ulu that range from Samoan, Micronesian, um, Hawaiian that we hope to grow. And within that, uh, we have a demonstration farm where we can do propagation with our homesteaders and the extended farming community. Um, and we'll share with our other homestead communities here on the east side and then hopefully beyond. So I think that's pretty neat about our project. That is. Um, unique components, Makala? Um, any unique components? Uh, I think I think Justine kind of kind of covered covered those. Those things that the unique the uniqueness of, of it was us having these these plant materials ready for um, our community to share and to share that knowledge as well and um, and and also uh, the the partnership with Noah and and their and their knowledge I think that's pretty a pretty unique um, pairing as well so yes. just to cool. kind of echo Justine and Pua. Absolutely. Um, uh, Pua, from Noah's perspective, what are the unique components of this specific project? Um, one is the fact that we're working with a Native Hawaiian community. Um, as Maka Ala said, you know, the trust between federal government and the Native Hawaiians in general have not been historically very positive. So, you know, being a Native Hawaiian working for a federal agency, you know, it was really important for me to make sure that, you know, this is my community. And so let's make sure that we, through these projects or whatever work that we do, we do it in a way that's right, weaving in the fact that, you know, this is our community, we're going to stay here um, and, you know, helping educate others. Um, another really um, unique perspective <clears throat> is that um, it's a co-production of knowledge. Right, so we're working with the community. This is not us coming in and telling the community what they need. It is us listening to what they need and how can we help them get where they want. You know, it's blending traditional knowledge um, associated with agroforestry and planting with Western science. And how does that all loop in um, the NOAA climate re related data, um, especially um, you know, as it relates to um, how climate conditions will change over time, trends and patterns, uh, what is the best assortment of plants that will survive over the long term, inform folks when to plant, harvest, extra watering, shading, etc., that will be needed as it relates to El Nino and La Nina and those shifts. Um, and then I think the last sort of unique 
perspective from NOAA is that all of our line offices are looking to help in some way, shape, or form. So it's not just specifically NESDAs. You have the fisheries component. You have the weather service component. You have our geographic um, service component. You have our sanctuary component. So all of the line offices play a role in this project, which is really unique. And lastly is um, our funding mechanism is the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, which has been a huge partner um, and really, really helpful in getting um, the, the money to the community um, in a way that maximizes the amount um, and not so much you know, with overhead and things like that. Um, so they've been amazing um, and really how they understand and embrace the incorporation of traditional knowledge and place-based knowledge and how everything, like Makaala said, everything that you do on land affects the ocean. So you're saying this project and the other dashboard projects too are two-way streets. Noah's providing the science tools to help cope with the weather impacts of climate change and looking to the native communities to provide wisdom to help refine those weather models. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, because every um, we have microclimates. Um, every community Absolutely. is different, um, and so it's not a one size fits all. So it's really taking the time and building first that trust and relationship with that community, and taking that time to talk to them, really seeing what they what they need, and how has climate change shifted some of their traditional practices? You know, whether it's you know, and how does that overlay with the El Nino and La Nina seasons and and help to inform them, right? So it's really that sort of cyclical, it's a very beautiful relationship. And we're so lucky that the community is working with us on this project. Absolutely. Hawaii seems like the perfect place for a polyforestry poly project. You know, you have that, that rainforest on the one side and more arid on the other side. But you know, year round growing conditions. There's also that deep native tradition of Aloha Aina, you know, that sense of stewardship of the land. Um, can you talk a little bit about the project location, um, the land itself? Um, Miley, could you address that? Sure, Bob. Um, so if anyone is familiar with the Hawaii Islands, there's actually eight major islands and we are located on Hawaii Island, which people call the big island and um, the largest island in our Hawaii chain. There's a, about five volcanoes, I believe here, one still active. And so please come and visit Kilauea <laughs> um, and visit Maui too, because they need your help. <laughs> um, but uh, so we are on the east side, the windward side of uh, Hawaii Island. So we're on the green side. Um, the Kona side, the other side of the island, the leeward is the drier side. I don't know if you heard about the, they, we've had recent fires on that side of the island. And so, but we're on the wet side, green, we're surrounded by green. And Panaeva is a Native Hawaiian community here. We are a Native Hawaiian homestead community. And uh, we're an agricultural community. Um, the Farmers Association, the Kale Kahapana Ava Farmers Association um, is uh, the lead association for our agricultural community. Our, we have lots from five to 40 acres here. So, um, you know, this has been a, a farming community. And when you talk about uniqueness, one of the unique um, things about being here in Pana Ava, not only is it beautiful, but it's not a transient community. It's, it's a community that has deep roots. Um, and a lot of the people who live in this community have been in this community and in Keokaha for, for generations. And so it's, it's a beautiful place and um, a wonderful place to have uh, NOAA partner with us on this project. We actually already were discussing this poly polyforestry project before NOAA contacted us. A couple of years ago, we updated our master plan and we um, created a Pana, uh, Pana Eva Resiliency Hub and Agricultural Innovation Master Plan. And this polyforestry project and growing, uh, creating food security in our community actually was a part of that project. Part of it is building a facility um, to help 
um, uh, you know, center us in our workshops. And also that hub is, is going to be part of our disaster. We've been talking disaster preparedness here um, for, for a long time, especially after uh, Kilauea uh, went through um, that community and we saw what happened there. So um, this polyforestry project is incorporated into part of our master plan. So when uh, Maka'ala connected with Pua, I went, oh my goodness, is there was something in the air because we we already were talking about agricultural innovation and how to do food security in our community. And so this project is is in alignment with what where our master plan is and what we're, we're intending to do for our community. We've been doing uh, agricultural workshops. Um, Justine has been coordinating agricultural workshops for us for a really long time, I, I, at least for the past 17, I've been living here for 17 years. So we've been doing agricultural workshops um, and providing all kinds of opportunities for our community here. When COVID hit, we were we distributed food, made sure our kupuna um, had food and uh, Justine coordinated that. And so this, this is part of our resiliency, our Panaeva resiliency hub is the polyforestry project. We, we have about 10.6 acres and um, and we're working on, we just completed our environmental assessment um, and that was finalized. So we are working on building that center, that hub for our, this community. And um, um, this project is um, a major component and it's one of the first steps for us to build that kind of resilience in our community. You're listening to the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove. We're speaking with Tom DiLiberto, Pua Kamaka, Justine Kamelamela, Mela Luavai, and Maka Ala Rollins about polyforestry and NOAA's climate dashboard. So let's talk more about the community. Who is your project serving? Eileen? Our project is serving primarily our Native Hawaiian community. So we are the agricultural community. We have about over 1,500 um, people living in our community, but we also have a sister community, a residential community near us, and we have another sister community in um, Keokaha. Um, I believe combined we have about two, at least 2,500. We haven't done, we haven't updated the census yet, and so, but um, so we're not only serving our community, but we're serving um, our larger community. And it's not just Native Hawaiians. A lot of our workshops have been a lot of stakeholders who are interested in food security and in growing, um, either growing their own. So, um, but primarily it's it's our Native Hawaiian um, homestead community. And like I said, uh, most of us have agricultural lots. Um, you know, my husband raise, raises sheep. We have neighbors who raise cattle. And so this is, all incorporated into what we're doing here as a community. Um, but this is this is taking it a step further. Um, and uh, what I love about this project and what our community loves about this project is, you know, our indigenous ways are being severely impacted by climate change. I mean, we can no longer, we, we, we have, um, you know, we have a moon calendar and, and all these things that um, for years our Native Hawaiians have relied on for planting seasons and planting cycles. And for me, because I live on a farm and I'm seeing the changes around me, the growth patterns um, um, and the, the cyclic changes going on with it, within my own farm, um, being data driven and using data and science to help inform us and to really revamp our indigenous um, ways and thoughts and processes is, is really important. Um, because as you know, Bob, climate change is here and, and, and we need to adapt. And this project, I believe part of it is part of that adaptation and our community sees it around us. Um, and we're impacted because most of us have farmed, we're impacted 
uh, by climate change daily. We, we, you know, we're not in this cement community where you really don't see it. We see it in the changing and the, the, the patterns of what is being uh, grown in our community. You know, lychee used to come out every April. April. Now I'm not really sure when my lychee trees are going to blossom. I'm like, what? You know, there used to be a consistent pattern. That mm -hmm. pattern, as you know, Bob, is no longer consistent. So having creating a this project and using science to help us really try to adapt to these changing conditions um, is really important. And this, I, I believe, our Native Hawaiian community, we're really excited about this partnership. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the idea that we're helping the farmers with this science knowledge and, and drawing their experience, that's great. What about the larger world community? I mean, you're a farmer, you're growing your own food, and you understand the implications of climate firsthand. But at the same time, all the other people in the world that may not be farmers, but they're still going to face food scarcity. You know, our traditional food systems, our commercial food systems around the world are being radically disrupted by climate change. Areas that grow the majority of the world's food are now being turned into deserts or flooded. You know, that that is going to be a worldwide challenge. How does this project and your work, how do we take that and lift that up to the rest of the world? Anyone? I love Maka, Maka Ala is our philosopher. So Maka Ala. Excellent. Well, excellent. That is a philosophical like, question. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> So, so how do we how do we take how do we take this this challenge and and move forward with it? Was that was that the specific question? It's more a question um, of how how do you um, how how does your project how does this project become a model for other communities around the world? Mm. Well, um, well, we're we're hoping we're hoping that that this project uh, with the partnership. Um, with Noah's partnership, it, it can be a model in a sense it, that we can we can show that their indigenous communities can work with the federal government. <laughs> but one, um, and I think that's that's one part. But I think on the on the agri on the agricultural side, um, I, I look at it as if we can plant more trees and we can. Um, Change our practices and adapt to the to these to the to the to the climate that that's that's, that's being presented with us. Then I, I think that that'll be a success. So I think um, you know just reinforcing our um, indigenous ingenuity and and our adaptability and and and, and promoting those ideas of uh, looking to our traditional sources of knowledge uh, and. And, and trying to marry that now with, with new information, new knowledge. And like how Miley was saying, um, to pair those things and, 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 uh, and be adaptive because in a sense, that's what, um, that's what people are and, uh, and ought to be is adaptive. And so uh, we, we learn a lot from our ancestors, our kupuna, and, and they were adaptive as well. They, they took things, um, and and adapted them to to their place so i think if we can put out knowledge or put out the things that we know and we can speak from our doorstep like this is what works for us this is what, this is what has been working for us um hopefully some of those attitudes can can be implemented in into people and and um and have that kind of more maybe if uh, more of a behavioral okay. change, but just like maybe a thought process, you know? So you're the project so represents we, a level of collaboration that we could share with other communities. How, how do we collaborate and work together to solve the food Def problem? Definitely. The and, and not just to solve the food problem, but but yeah, other things as well too, right? Like um, this, this project is about, uh, about um, food res uh, resiliency, not just um, Food resiliency, but climate resiliency as well. So, um, having people in different parts of the world think about being more resilient and, and crops that are resilient, and and uh, and and, and create an environment where you can be you can be resilient is for me. I think is is is, is important. 
climate equity is something we talk about a lot on this show. I mean, we're, we're very aware that the people most impacted by climate change are often the people least responsible for it. Um, and I've heard you address climate equity in terms of your equity roundtables and such like that. Um, this, this project itself seems to have a lot of equity components. I understand that, that many of your, some of your community is actually displaced and the, the idea by climate and by government, whatever, all these different things that have left people homeless and that this project is helping them address that. Would one of you like to talk story on that? Justine? So um, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, climate equity, your, your communities, um, you know, that, that there's been displacement of the communities and working through this and other projects, that it's helping you reestablish roots, the homestead groups, that kind of thing. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Uh, for me, being, being down in that space, you know, allows me to connect with community. Uh, a lot of us like to stay on our homestead. <laughs> So um, it's really a good space that fosters fellowship um, and that I'm grateful for. And then with fellowship, we learn about each other. So we're able to, um, you know, what's happening on my homestead isn't necessarily what's happening on someone else's homestead. So coming together and um, sharing stories like um, on our homestead, the rain, the rain patterns are different here now than it was when we first moved back home in 2014. So sharing that information with each other allows us to um, work together and um, address that on our homesteads, like where I would put mulch er earlier than I would before to help with, um, you know, with moisture and retaining the moisture for our plants. But um, yeah. Okay, thank you. What about the project's goals? I mean, you have both short-term and long-term goals, Miley? Mm -hmm. Well, the, our long-term goal um, in our 300 page master plan, um, <laughs> our long-term goal is to create our own safe, space and place for our community where our community can come together. Um, it, it's a resilient place um, where we have elements of food security. Um, if there's a disaster, um, there is a place for the community to go where that is the hub that we're gonna be building. Um, that, is, that, can, that is still connected to the world and um, you know, off grid being able to um, support our community. That's that's the long term. In good times, it's a place where we gather, we provide workshops, um, we have cultural and agricultural pro uh, agricultural programs. We have keiki, which is children to kupuna programs for our order community. But it's also a place that. Um, and we have our polyforestry project and we're planning other um, innovative agricultural projects. And so um, in, in tough times, and I'm going to tell you that I, I always panic during hurricane season. Um, and that's one of the reasons I need to get this hub up because of the last hurricane that came through here, it didn't even come close to us. And it was a you know it's scary for our community so having um organizing our community and planning for disaster preparedness and resilience right if that comes through where do we go we have a center and a place for our community to come to where we can provide all the kinds of services that they need and so that's the long-term vision um and the short term of course is having um amazing projects like um, this project to start building those pieces toward that long-term um, vision. So you, you talked about the windward leeward side of the island and obviously the windward side is where all the rain drops, you know, the trade winds blow 
the moisture, they hit the mountains of volcanoes and it drops and the other side of the island is very dry. Um, your polyforestry, obviously on the rainforest side, does your, your master plan, your 300 pages, does it address transporting food to the other side of the island? No, we don't, I don't, you know, our focus is, uh, well, when we were discussed creating our Pana Eva hub, the goal was to have this be uh, a model for other communities. So everyone has their hub. Um, because if there's a major disaster, we just need to focus on getting this community, you know, we're on about 2000 acres here, right? Getting this community um, focused. So our goal in developing the Pana Eva hub is the vision that there should be a hub in each community. You know, and part of it was when the volcano um, destroyed um, Pahoa and, and, and our, our sister community um, on the other side of us was that they brought together people and created their own hubs. If you look at Lahaina right now, what's happening, it wasn't the government that came in. And I've, I've told my community, we cannot depend on the government. We need to get organized and be able to depend on ourselves. And every time there's a disaster, we see that, we saw it in Lahaina. Like the only way that they got food and water is, you know, people, my cousins and a whole bunch of other people who have big boats were bringing it in from the ocean. There was no help for that community for a long time. And so, you know, uh, it's, our goal is to create a model so, and to rep help communities replicate these models. So every community, has their hub and is organized in good times, but in organized um, in disaster preparedness. I hear you. Uh, Pua, what about from NOAA's pr perspective? What are what is NOAA's short-term, long-term goals in these kind of projects? You're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, one of NOAA's short-term goals is to really continue to build this relationship, you know, show that we can work with communities and use this as an example for other communities like, hey, you can trust us, we're here to help. Um, I think that's one of one of our short term goals. And then the other is to co develop and deploy the polyforestry and climate dashboard um, services and products. Um, to aggregate and tailor information to help guide these communities um, and the agroforestry over the long term and short term. And then, you know, building the food security and also with that food security also comes health, right? So if we're going back to indigenous plants and food sources, your community will not only be fed, but be fed healthier foods. Um, so it's also a health component. Um, and then in, you know, sharing this, the successes of this project with other hubs, as Mali was discussing, um, and then even broader is sharing it with our community within the broader Pacific. Because, you know, climate change is really here. It's really affecting our island communities. We're all sort of in the same situation, but how can we learn and share information with each other so we can continue to be the resilient indigenous people that we are. Tom, you've been quiet throughout this whole thing. You know, you're, you're I hear talk about, oh, we don't trust the government and stuff. And, you know, are they talking about you there? And I'm just kidding. You don't have to answer that. But um, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the other climate dashboards? I mean, I'm hearing there's seven or eight of these pilot projects across the country. Can you tell us a little bit about where, what communities they're working with, how they're different? Sure, I hope people can trust me. Um, but you have to earn trust, and I think that's important. I think that's one thing that's been mentioned a lot. And that's one thing that NOAA and NOAA leadership are really highlighting and prioritizing is not for NOAA to come in with a bunch of data and a bunch of our own ideas of how things are going to happen and say this is how it's going to be. And uh, instead, it's the opposite, really, where these regional, uh, the NOAA's regional collaboration network with these climate equity roundtables and the pilot projects that have come out of that have really been developed uh, community up. Climate 
change is obviously affecting everybody, but doesn't affect everybody equally, doesn't affect everybody at the same time. Um, and the key thing to note with all of this is that for solutions and how to build resilience is from Washington, D.C., where I am, I'm not going to know what is the best way or no is not going to know necessarily know the best way of helping your community become more resilient. You probably know more, but we have a lot of data and we can provide a lot of help. And that's one aspect that is is unique with this is that, you know, climate data in and of itself isn't going to solve climate change. People are going to solve climate change. So what's the best way that we can put the data into the hands of the people who know what they need, know what their community need to build uh, solutions of adaptation and resilience. So um, this is one really great example of that um, happening um, in Hawaii. There are other projects working on heat health in the Southeast and the Southwest. There's um, projects working on floods and flood controls along the Mississippi. Um, uh, in Alaska, there's a, a project working on um, with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium as well. So um, the key thing here is that all of these projects are different, but the key thing here is the community component and the listening component from NOAA um, and, and is really going in there and earning trust. And I think that's incredibly important. You, you don't earn trust by telling people to trust you, you earn trust by showing people that they can trust you. And are all of these pilot projects working with, with a native group, a native community? They're working with underserved communities, vulnerable communities across the entire country. There are components with um, indigenous groups all across the across the country, but um, the key component here: these are communities that we know are impacted first and worst, who may not um, have the resources necessary to 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 deal with the uh, the impacts from climate change that are already happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really applaud Noah's focus on the equity issues and getting gaining this indigenous knowledge. In fact, it reminds me of the guidance released by the White House in 2022. You know, the federal agencies should recognize and include indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge. Um, I think you were running before that. I'm, I'm wondering the relationship between that memo and what you're doing, Tom. Well, that was, uh, I mean, by all means, to speak up as well um, from the NOAA perspective. But it, it was key. I think that's one thing you've heard is that it wasn't like with this project that NOAA came and the project sprang forth, right? This was happening um, already. And it's incorporating this knowledge into how um, we work, how, you know, it's again, it's a two-way street here. We have all this data, right? But how can we incorporate indigenous knowledge or how can um, we combine uh you know, these efforts in, in order to, and that, that was a really good guidance for NOAA because historically, um, before that, not necessarily was being used whole across the entire government. So it was nice to see that come out. Somebody else want to comment on that? I can. Um, I think that that memo really just gave us the backbone um, and sort of the the backing that we needed to do the work that we have sort of already been doing here, um, but implementing it in a way that people could see how valuable indigenous knowledge really is um, in decision-making um, and bringing those indigenous voices and perspectives to the table, because really they're the ones who are affected. That's, this is their home. And so having that memo allowed them a place and a voice at the table. So we're about out of time. I'd like to just go around the room and ask each of you what you have learned from this project and what the project can teach other communities around the world. And let's just start with you, Pua. I've learned that anything is possible if you have trust and you have the right people in place. Um, and you can help others within your own agency learn from this through your values. Um, and so that's been just an amazing opportunity to work with Makaola, Justine, and Maile on this. Um, and also that another important component that we are doing here is we're not just providing the data expertise or the funding, we're also providing the sweat. And so a lot of our NOAA Ohana has come over and participated in the community work day so the community can see us. NOAA's mission of science, service, and stewardship. 
this is it. We want to change that and shift that. Akahala, what have you learned from the project and what it can, what can it teach other communities? Um, I think what I've learned, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I think, okay. Yeah, I think what I've, I think what I've learned um, is, is a lot of um, about community building and, and, and trust, you know, like how Pua was saying too, like, and, and, and uh, Tom was saying, uh, and from our perspective in our, in our community, um, it's, it's been a good learning experience because it's, it's been actually kind of um, easier for me to stand up in front of people and say, this is what, this is what we need because it's not me necessarily saying it, it's our community and our, and our, and our elders that have want, wanted these things. And so it's just, um, us being a conduit for for our for our for our kupuna for our elders, so that we we can um, have the change that they want to see. So I think Thank that's you. been a learning one for me. Justine, what have you learned, and what can the project teach other communities? Uh, I want to build off of Makaala. Um, I've learned, um, you know, to to rely on our community, uh, to ask for help from our community, and um, that they they show up, you know, um, and to and to trust our community and the vision that our kupuna set forth, and that's something that I feel that um, we offer and that people can learn from us also. Mahalo. All right. What have you learned from the project? What can it teach other communities? Um, I've learned that, you know, that even though we have this vision now, like Maka'ala and Justine said, this came from Kupuna. And a lot of the Kupuna who originally mentored me in this community, they're no longer here. Um, like Uncle Randy Ahuna, Uncle Howard Pea, they're no longer here. But but they are here. And so what I learned is we can take the seeds from their original vision and we can actually make sure that we plant those seeds and make it happen. Because what we're doing, it's actually for our little tiny community, it's what we're doing is actually a real big deal. And normally it would be these larger politically connected communities and all the politicians, but, you know, but, but if you, you take those seeds and you cultivate them and you put that energy and, um, and love behind it. And of course you have great partners like Noah and working with Pua Kamaka and Tom and all the, the wonderful people that I've met uh, with Noah and our community members. Um, what I've learned is you can take you can take what was planted and you can actually grow that into something amazing and build that you know resilience is build that resilience for your community and then and they can see that happening so that's that's what i've learned it's um just to keep putting that positive energy and um in into focus and um and keep on moving forward on what our kupuna, I think they would be proud of us. They would be sitting here with us um, and there would be two, a couple of more boxes if they were still here and they'd, they'd be speaking to that. So th that's what I've learned. Tom, what have you learned from the project? What can the world learn from it? Well, it's, what amazes me, sometimes I forget as a person who's in the data a lot, and looking at things, I uh, am an El Nino expert by training, and I make a forecast for El Nino, and we talk about how there are impacts, we talk about it in a global sense, and we talk about, oh, there might be issues, but this project has just taught me how much work needs to go in to build it and how important community is um, for really building resilience. And it's one thing that I think is applicable anywhere across the entire world. So while this project might be focused on, you know, um, uh, Hawaii, but it, 
the concept behind building community and building resilience together and incorporating indigenous knowledge and incorporating, you know, and discussing all this, this is something that could be applied anywhere. Um, and it's it's something that it's it's inspiring and it's something that it's taught me a lot about, you know, going beyond just this idea of just looking at, you know, the data, for instance, but like un truly understanding what it takes and what needs to happen in order to build uh, climate resilience. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. Where can our listeners go to learn about the um, Kuhui Opana Eva project? Justine? Right now, we're, we're working. We're working on establishing a space um, where people can come and learn more. But if you are curious about the project, you can um, email, email us at panaevahub at gmail.com. Mahalo. About the Panaeva Farmers Association, Meili? You're muted. They can also come to our website. It's it's long. It's keokahapanaevafarmersassociation.com. And so, um, and we we have a page that we'll be updating. One of the web pages will update for the poly, polyforestry project. And we will put the website, the long website, in the text below this broadcast. Um, Tom, what about NOAA? Um, where are people go learn about more about this and other NOAA projects? So if you want to learn more about NOAA's regional collaboration network, um, you can go to noaa.gov slash regional hyphen collaboration hyphen slash network. You can learn more about the climate equity roundtables. You can learn more about the pilot projects going on all across the entire country. And Pua, are there other resources you'd like to share? Yes. Um, and if you want to learn specifically more um, about our pilot project, you it's noaa.gov backslash regional dash collaboration dash network backslash regions dash Pacific dash islands. So a little bit longer. Everybody has such long URLs here. <laughs> uh, Makaala, is there any resources you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, no, they, everybody has um, put their emails and websites and that's that's great. Mahalo. No. Mahalo. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners. We welcome your questions and feedback. You can learn more about the Climate Hour at climatehour.net. That's climatehour.net, a nice short URL. Or you can tell us what you think about polyforestry by emailing comments at climatehour.net. This is the Climate Hour. I'm your host, Bob Grove.